and those who want to listen to their health problems, uh, stay here. Okay, here is health station and uh, uh, family and gender is in that room. Accept. Francesca? Yes, it's me. Uh, uh, Della Posa. Yes, right? yes, okay. yes. I'll moderate this panel. <laughs> Okay, please be seated, and we are starting this panel uh, where we discuss health. And uh, I invite the slides. I invite our first, discuss, uh, first presenter, Francesca Della Posa from the European Bank on the Reconstruction and Development. And could you please put the slides on? Слайды включите, пожалуйста. And Francesca will present us uh, the impact, uh, the paper on the impact of transition on height and subjective well-being. And uh, I think this, uh, the results of this study are now published in the UBRD transition report, right? Yes, so you can find it there. Включите, пожалуйста, слайды. So we continue with this with the same format. Each presenter has 15 minutes, then five minutes for discussion, and then questions from the audience. Right. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a real honor for me to be here today to present this paper. Um, it's a joint work with some uh, colleagues from the BRD, um, including Chief Economist, who is 
going to be uh, also here presenting some of her work. Um, the main um, aim of this paper is to study or to take a look at what the impact of transition has been on well-being. So, um, well, I will start, I will just give you a motivation for the um, study, talk about the data a little bit, and then move to the results in the interest of time. I will present the main results of the paper. There are secondary results, but I will just focus on the ones that are relevant for today's session. Um, and then I'll move to the conclusions. Um, so, um, okay. Right. Um, so, um, well, you know this better than me, but uh, transition from plan to um, to market economy has been a major transformation, brought about a major transformation uh, that has encompassed social, economic, political spheres and has affected the lives of millions of people across the region. Uh, the early years of such process were um, accompanied by a deep recession uh, that was short-lived in some countries, but uh, long-lasting in others, and um, uh, uh, GDP fell substantially, but um, consumption uh, resumed quite quickly. Um, in the long term, there's, uh, there are quite, quite a lot of papers that point to the, to the fact that microeconomically speaking, uh, the performance of transition has proved a success. So uh, today's income levels in uh, post-transition countries are generally not, not, not on average like um, higher than they were um, in the pre-transition period. Um, however, however there, there's widespread perception that especially the early years of the transition period uh, were very painful and brought about a real hardship for the people. So um, in our paper, what we want to look at is whether that pain was perceived, was it real? And if it was real, was it a temporary thing or has it had, um, um, uh, persistent effects on well-being of, of the people in the region. So, for instance, there there's a, a quite large uh, body of literature that uh, shows that um, the levels of life satisfaction of people in the post-communist re region have historically been lower than the levels of life satisfaction of people in, for instance, Western Europe. Um, so, um, we think also that this question is quite relevant, not just for the transition, transition re region per se, but it's relevant for all countries that are undergoing or underwent or will undergo um, uh, institutional reforms because it tells us how uh, costly uh, from a sort of societal point of view these reforms could be and it could help us figure out um, why people oppose uh, reforms, for instance, and what leads to policy reversals. So, um, as I said, we measured, we try to measure the impact of transition on well-being. We look at objective and subjective well-being. So, for um, objective well-being, basically, we um, the our outcome variable is adult height. I'll explain a little bit later why we chose that variable. But basically, um, there's a um, um, well, quite a vast literature actually that shows how socioeconomic deprivation, especially uh, during the first years of someone's life, um, leads to um, lower adult height. And so um, in our paper, we look at what happened uh, to those people who were born um, at the start of transition or in the few years before the start of transition. And we compared their adult height to the height of people who were born before or after that period. And then we look at subjective well-being, so life satisfaction, but also some other attitudes. So um, there's also literature that points to the fact that um, people's beliefs, attitudes, and habits are shaped uh, when uh, in one, during one formative year, so in the period between the ages of 18 and 25. And once the, those habits habits or beliefs are formed, they become persistent. Their habits don't really change or just evolve very slowly after that period. So we look at cohorts that were aged 18, 18 to 25 when uh, transition started, and we compare their attitudes and levels of life satisfaction, um, their attitudes and levels of li life satisfaction to the attitudes and levels of life satisfaction of uh, people um, who, are, who are older and or younger. Um, so just a preview of the results. So basically, we do find that transition uh, was uh, painful, was a painful process. So today, the people who are born around the start of transition are shorter, uh, around one centimeter, than their counterparts who were born before or after. 
We do not find that transition has had any negative long-term implications in terms of life satisfaction for people born in that period. If anything, the report, these people report higher levels of life satisfaction. But um, this finding comes with a caveat, meaning that the impact has been heterogeneous, and I'll explain why. And uh, individuals who were aged 18 and 25 during that period today report um, um, higher support for um, market economy and democracy, but we do not find any other effect on uh, other attitudes such as trust or uh, life satisfaction or preference for income redistribution. So um, just an introduction on why which is basically hide and, well, life satisfaction. Um, so um, hide is uh, determined um, mostly by genetics for 80 percent and uh, by environmental factors 20 percent. So although it looks like uh, you know environmental factors only contribute to one fifth of, of someone someone's height, um, environmental conditions are uh, explain uh, the majority of variation in average height across different populations. And importantly, um, there are three key moments in somebody's life uh, when height is quite easily influenced by uh, external environmental conditions. And these are the intrauterine period, childhood, meaning first usually first three years of someone's life, and adolescence. So um, there's a very large body of literature that shows that adverse condition conditions during childhood, for, for instance, lead to stunting or basically lower adult height in, um, when the individual reaches adult height. And also early life improvements lead to improvement in someone's height. Um, so, um, and importantly, episodes that affect somebody's height affect also other outcomes. So there are papers that link um, adverse um, episodes to uh, lower educational attainments, lower um, IQ, um, uh, um, studies that basically show how um, adverse episodes affect um, cognitions or confidence of people. So in this sense, because height and um, other outcomes earnings, IQ, educational attainments are correlated. Uh, we use height as a marker for the quality of life for people in these key moments, uh, but we, in our paper, we mostly focus on childhood. So the period of life between ages zero and three. Um, and uh, finally, we also look at life satisfaction and attitude. And as I said, um, attitudes and beliefs are usually formed um, and become persistent once a per person is uh, basically aged between 18 and 25. And there's literature that shows how, for instance, living through a recession per permanently affects somebody's voting behavior, preferences for redistribution, uh, trust in other people, or um, stock market participation. So um, the data we use, uh, we use for our main analysis, the Life in Transition Survey, which is a cross-country survey implemented by DBRD and the World Bank. And the latest round was implemented last year in 2016. Um, it covers 34 countries, uh, 29 of which are post-communist countries, and then uh, five countries that are not, that are comparator countries. And these are Cyprus, Greece, Italy, um, Germany, and Turkey. And then for um, our robustness check, we also use the Russia uh, Longitudinal Monitoring Study, which covers only one country, but um, includes data on several household members. So if you remember, I said that height is determined by genetics for 80%. So in that data set, we have information on um, basically um, a lot of household members, adults, parents, and their children. So in those regressions, we, we use basically this data set to rerun our regressions and control for parental height, and therefore for the genetic component of height. Um, so our identification strategy is based on, well, basically we need, to, we need to define transition. And in our paper, we use the BRD um, transition indicators. So what the BRD usually does every year, um, we create transition indicators that um, reflect the status of the progress that uh, each country in uh, our region um, has made uh, in several uh, sectors, across several sectors. And one of that is price liberalization reforms. Um, so we looked at those indicators uh, over time, and um, uh, we looked at the moment when uh, each country in the transition region reached a state that is uh, 
one of um, basically um, quite an advanced state, a, sta a state that is similar to basically uh, advanced industrialized economies. And um, um, according to the transition indicators, um, the countries in our region basically reached uh, price liberalization in different moments of times, and that's how we define the start of a transition period. So in our regressions, we basically have an indicator, uh, like a binary indicator so that tells us when transition started, and we also use the change in transition indicators to look at the depth and the speed of those transitions, uh, of, of those um, reforms year by year. Um, so this is the main specification that we use for high regressions. So we regress, uh, well in this case the outcome will be height, adult height on um, um, an indicator, the set, which um, takes value one if the individual was born, um, thank you, um, during transition or shortly before. Um, uh, um, a vector of individual characteristics, which include whether the individual was born in urban or rural uh, locality, um, the gender of the respondent, uh, parental characteristics, so the level of education and sector of employment of the parents, religion, whether the individual was born um, in a country that was affected by a conflict, um, and then we also control for country fixed effects and the linear time trend, which basically is supposed to pick up the fact that over time, as um, standards of living improve in each country, we also see a natural in, um, improvement in height. So these are, uh, these are the main results. So um, this table basically shows um, um, the results for, for different binary indicators that we use. The first one is whether the individual was born at in the first year of transition when price liberalization reforms, the bulk of price liberalization reforms were implemented. Whether the individual was born in that year or the year before, so the individual was one, or whether the individual was born one or two when price liberalization reforms were implemented, because as I said, height is affected uh, when the mostly when the individual is uh, age zero to three. So we try to look at the effect um, for all these people. And we see that basically um, people who were born at the start of transition are today uh, one point uh, 19 centimeters shorter than their counterparts who were born before and after. So it has quite a substantial effect. And when we control for the level of GDP at that time, we see that the fall in GDP does not completely explain the, the, um, the fall in height. Um, with, as I said, there were a bunch of controls. So, for instance, we estimate also the impact of war, and for people, the, the, the effect is very similar. So, people who are born uh, in a conflict area um, um, uh, have are also today around one centimeter shorter than their counterparts. Um, however, the effect is fully explained by the changes in GDP. Uh, women are shorter than men. Uh, people born in urban areas are also, we find a negative effect, so they're shorter today than their counterparts born in rural localities. Parental education has a positive effect on somebody's height. Um, we look at also at the impact of being born in transition on life satisfaction. Uh, as I said, we do not find that people who are born uh, in transition are report lower levels of life satisfaction than their counterparts. If anything, we find a positive effect. Um, and we look at uh, attitudes and life satisfaction of people who are in the formative years, as I said. We do not find any effect on trust or optimism or preferences for distribution, but we find that those people today are more supportive of uh, democracy and market economy. Um, the effects are heterogeneous. So basically, um, so we do not, for the effects of uh, born, being born in transition on height, we do not find differential effects of, uh, uh, by gender or by locality of birth. Um, but we do find the, the positive effect on life satisfaction is driven by women in the sample and by people who are born in non-underprivileged households. So um, for people who are born in a household where the mother never worked or where the mother had no education, we find that the positive effect on life satisfaction actually, well, is not there, it's not significant. Um, ethnic minorities who spent uh, formative, their formative years in transition today report lower levels of trust than their counterparts. Um, if we split the sample uh, in um, basically uh, between countries uh, according to their GDP level, um, we find that the effect is driven by countries that had a GDP lower than 10,000 
um, dollars. So basically, the effect is driven by the poorest countries. The reason why we do that is that basically um, there's a phenomenon called high association. So um, it is true that as uh, standards of living improve, also height increases. But to, to a certain extent, at some point, improve further improvements in GDP do no longer translate into improvement in height. So we wanted to basically drop those countries that had already reached that level because that might have affected our results. And then uh, the negative effect is also um, more pronounced in some um, in Central Asia, uh, basically, and uh, in the Caucasus, and um, uh, in Belarus, Ukraine, and Moldova. So when we look at uh, when we drop the other countries from our sample, we find that uh, results are more pronounced and the magnitude is larger. Uh, we run some placebo tests, basically trying to understand whether it was not really the effect of place liberalization reform that uh, um, f basically drives our results, but just the changes that were happening in that moment of time. So instead of looking at the time of the liberalization reforms, we look at 1989 or 1991. We do not find an effect. Um, we do not find effect for uh, cohorts born after transition, uh, one to three years after transition, three to five years after transition. Uh, so we're confident we're picking up, we were chosen the correct uh, cohorts, and we do not find effects on uh, cohorts born in the early 1990s in non-transition countries. Um, I'll move quickly to, I'll uh, conclude quickly uh, talking about the uh, Russian um, case. So basically, as I said, this data set has information on several household members, and we use it to control for parental height. We have information on siblings, so basically we run a within um, estimation, uh, looking at siblings that were born in transition and siblings that were born before and after, and we find that our effects are still there, and actually they're stronger. So we predict that uh, siblings born in transition are today three centimeters shorter than siblings born in other periods of time, and we also match some maternal characteristics uh, to make sure that there was no endogenous fertility choice and we find that our results are robust. So uh, this is a conclusion. Sorry, I had to rush through the slides. Um, but basically, yes, we do find that uh, uh, transition was um, brought about really real hardship. Today's um, um, the adult height of, um, of people who are born around that moment is lower than the height of uh, their counterparts. Um, there haven't been long-term implications in terms of life satisfaction, but we've seen that there are some caveats, and uh, people who are in their formative years around the start of the time are today more supportive of institutions such as democracy and market economy. And that was all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I invite Edward Norton to comment on this paper. You have five minutes. Thank you. Um, my name is Edward Norton I'm from the University of Michigan. I'm really delighted to be able to discuss this paper. I do have slides, although, um, OK, they're coming. Um, I, I, I don't have a lot to say other than this is a great paper. It really is. And believe me, I do not always say that. Um, so I found this a really interesting topic. They use appropriate data. They applied the methods very carefully. Um, and as I was reading through it, I kept sort of jotting down notes like, oh, this is going to be a problem, or I bet they're not going to check this. And then on the next page, sure enough, um, they, they um, had done exactly that. So um, they really anticipated most of my questions and comments and, and did a, a really great job. So uh, a couple comments and things I found interesting. They find this temporary decline in height of uh, roughly one centimeter if you're born right around the transition. And in one of the figures that was not shown uh, this afternoon, um, this result is temporary, and then it comes back up again. So I was just wondering, um, because this is not my area of, of research, why is there a rebound? And is there a difference in steady state? Can you say that in a market economy, people are one or two or three centimeters taller? So what's the, the steady state equilibrium? That's a different research question. I know, I know you were focusing on just the transition years, and there's certainly a lot in the paper already. But it does beg the question of what are sort of the longer run effects of uh, market economies compared to planned economies. It's kind of interesting. Um, 
And I also found it curious that you had these sort of two main results, which at least to me did not seem entirely consistent with each other. That is, um, that uh, you didn't find really any difference in happiness. So you have people who are shorter, and I would have expected them to be a little bit less happy, um, because in general we think taller people have other characteristics like higher income, um, and so forth that are correlated with happiness. And so you find uh, people are significantly shorter if born in the transition period, but then not uh, no difference in happiness. Um, so I found that interesting and, and I, I wasn't sure of sort of the explanation. Um, I also found the, the heterogeneity effects interesting. As usual, it's not just the overall number, it's what's going on with heterogeneous effects that's really interesting. And so um, looking by mother's education uh, or uh, people from poor backgrounds, disadvantaged backgrounds being affected more makes a lot of sense. Um, and so my only real suggestions for this part were to try to put your results in context with the other sort of vast literature that has looked at things that affect height. Um, so, you know, um, how many years of mother's education is equivalent to being born in transition? But you could also put this in terms of um, other papers, like the effect of famine on height, or uh, influenza, or being born early, or being a twin, or having more or less income. Or uh, given this large literature on what affects height, you, I think you could um, put your results in, in context with those. Um, with those other papers. So, uh, small suggestions, but really, really a great job. Um, so, uh, th those are my comments. Thank you. Um, we have time for about two questions, so please. Does anyone have a question? Okay, then probably you, Francesca, could uh, uh, respond to the comments. Uh, yes. Um, oh, yeah, sure. Um, so, um, yes, we have an estimated uh, longer run effect on market economy, and that's because it was easier um, to pick the starting point of transition, but it's much more difficult to pick an end point of that process. So I mentioned the other transition indicators, and for instance, one of them is small-scale privatization, large-scale privatization. Those are really interesting, but the point is we want to also to assess whether that has had an effect on people's well-being. But the problem with that is, first, these um, reforms happen later, so we don't have enough people that have the adult heights, and they're still ongoing. So um, it's a very interesting idea, but I think we will need to wait a bit more uh, to, to uh, take a look at those results. Um, the um, contradicting results, height and life satisfaction, uh, it is a bit puzzling. Um, if there is a table in, um, well, in the long section of tables of the paper that shows how these people that were born in transition are uh, more highly educated than their counterparts, and we thought that was somehow related. So maybe they had access to better education or like more opportunities given the opening up of the market. So we thought that, that this is kind of correlated. And the people born after transition, those are too young. We cannot really say a lot about them, whether they have also more opportunities or how their labor outcomes are. Um, and uh, uh, I think putting in context uh, and uh, comparing with other papers is yes, a great idea, and we'll try uh, to do that. Thank you. With the, uh, so the countries like Ukraine, where transition started later, mm -hmm. so it doesn't appear in the sample, basically, because like kids are 22 now, uh, the, the oldest, right? So it's not yet adult height. Uh, so you need to get 25, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so no, actually countries that are, um, had uh, transition later are still in the sample because if you remember, we compare people born basically in 1995 or four and three in Ukraine uh, with people born before, so in the pre-transition period and people born after. So if anything, yes, we have not a lot of people born after transition, but we can we compare people born before um, anyway, so there's a large sample. Thank you. And now, now I invite uh, 
Gintari Malisauskaite uh, to present her paper on alcohol consumption habits in Eastern and Western Europe. You have 15 minutes, please. Sure. <coughs> Can I have the... Thank you. Hello. Um, I'm Gintara. I'm, I feel very grateful and very lucky to be able to present my paper here as it's still part of my PhD thesis and I've been working on it with my supervisor, Alexander Klein. And basically we are interested in what, how communism as a system was shaping alcohol consumption. So that is why the name, Drinking and the Communism, and uh, is there any difference between Eastern and Western Europe? So first of all, this is an empirical study, and uh, we are basically interested in the difference between post-Soviet countries and their alcohol consumption and uh, the Western European countries, and we treat that uh, difference in uh, uh, alcohol consumption as a measure of cultural habits. So first of all, why there might be um, the difference? We do know the anecdotal evidence that apparently Eastern Europeans drink more. So that is why we thought maybe it would be interesting to find out if that is actually the case, if we control for many other things that might be shaping this behavior. So first of all, if we consider the history, we're, pla we're seeing, um, oh, uh, we're seeing the um, spread of cultural norms from Russia as such. Because there was a time, uh, the, there's abundant literature about how alcohol consumption is very important in Russia and how it was ceremonial and a very big part of culture. And um, there's gender divide, there was worker status uh, uh, assigned to it, and it was masculine to drink, it was not feminine to drink, and so on. And if you add to this, once uh, Soviet Union sort of increased in size, uh, there was limited mig migration between Eastern and Western part of Europe, but uh, there definitely was increased migration within Soviet Union. So in added to that the Blatt system, which meant that if you wanted to achieve something through formal routes, that might become difficult, so you had to find ways how to get what you want through informal routes. And um, then knowing that the regime itself lasted 40, 60 years, it gives enough time to take effect. Um, plus, um, it also gives enough time for cultural norms as such to take into generally intergenerational effect. Um, so the first, the research questions are, uh, if there is actually the difference between alcohol consumption in Eastern and Western Europe, and is it possible to blame the communist regime for that? Uh, then uh, if such difference exists, how sizable it is in comparison to other potential factors? Um, and any channels mentioned in the literature, how they are reflected. So quickly, with the literature review, these are the main determinants found to affect alcohol consumption, which would be gender, males tend to drink more, age, middle age people tend to drink more. Uh, education, usually literature suggests that lower educated people drink more. <laughs> uh, then marriage, uh, being married, uh, having a partner tends to have a preventative measure. Health, it's less um, certain, not uh, uh, slightly contradictive evidence, um, but uh, there's definitely a relationship between smoking and increase in alcohol consumption. Plus, we need to consider some geography as there are different uh, drinking patterns uh, due in Europe as let's say Northern European and Southern European, and uh, the alcohol, prevailing alcohol type in country also affects um, how it's being drunk. And uh, we also need to consider the transition as such, which means that um, um, 
Since the data includes the transition period too, we have to account for unemployment during that time. We had to account for any changes which might include uh, gender gap narrowing, uh, increase in alcohol consumption altogether. And um, for that, we have to consider just such things as gender, age, unemployment, education in our study. So this is the uh, regression form that we were running. So the, first, the two things that we're most interested at is uh, um, determinants are the communism and the post-communism. Uh, the um, dependent variables that we're using are two variables for alcohol consumption. So alcohol consumption frequency and binge drinking. Binge drinking is um, using more the drinking more than six units of alcohol on one occasion. And these variables are categorical. Now, communism is defined in a, I'm using a similar idea as previous um, um, reader did, which is those people that are exposed to the regime between the years of 18 and 25 uh, are in the, their years of increased socialization, which means that their cultural habits and behavior is being more defined, and then it tends to stick throughout the life. So, those people that were under the communist regime in that age would be defined as affected by the regime, and uh, for at least that period. If longer, it's obviously also um, um, affected by the regime. And post communists would be the people that did not quite, uh, uh, um, they were not exposed to the regime throughout that time. So basically everyone that came after those that we consider as affected. We control for country dummies. Uh, most of the other regressors suggested in the literature, which is age, education, gender, occupation, income, social circumstances, urbanization, uh, prevailing alcohol type, uh, um, health for one part of the regressions, smoking, physical activity, and environment. So we were running audit probit regressions due to the nature of the data, and also some conditional mixed process regressions because um, uh, we were interested in the effect of health, which we had to instrument, and CMP was the only model allowing for that, uh, with having both stages in order to probe it. So these are the results, and uh, I can only apologize for its size. So first of all, what is interesting here is that this is uh, the marginal effects for alcohol consumption frequency. And what we see is uh, that basically age is the main defining factor for alcohol consumption frequency. Um, as uh, the, all of these variables are highly significant at 5% significance level, and uh, also their effect is the largest. Following that comes uh, co communism, post-communism, work, uh, in, working in military and being unemployed. So, what that says is basically communism and post-communism dummies show that even after controlling for everything else, they are still very highly significant in defining the um, behavior, and uh, they're also quite large in size. They come as next after the most important age indicators. And of probably being unemployed is not surprising. Then the most protective effect is from being a female, which is suggested by the literature as well. Um, and uh, the following also significant but very small protective effects are from being widowed and uh, surprisingly higher household size. Now the same can, similar results for the binge drinking equations. Um, so, surprisingly, being affected by the communist regime comes up as the first and most important defining indicator for binge drinking. So, it's the largest in size in affecting um, the likelihood for binge drinking. 
After that follows age dummies as in being in early years as 20s and 30s. Then once again, unemployment, which is also quite sizable. Then not surprisingly, smoking. And uh, what I found quite interesting myself was violence. So being exposed to violent environment increases the possibility of binge drinking. Then, once again, the most protective effect is from being a female. Um, and following protective but smaller effects are from being of old age, uh, having higher levels of education, and a very small protective effect from higher income. So the regressions I just reported are all from audit probits, as I thought that it would simply be not enough time to go through the rest that I have. So these are just robustness checks. So basically, we did our homework and we tried to run as many possible variations of the same um, regre regressions using different regressors, uh, just to see that for the alcohol consumption frequency, uh, the effect of communism and post-communism is consistently significant and positive, so both would increase the likelihood of drinking alcohol more frequently. While for binge drinking, um, the communism effect is um, significant throughout and positive, while the one for post-communism is less consistent, and some you might, fi you might find it Mm, positive and significant, and some even negative and significant, and some insignificant at all. So th this varies, um, the sample size varies in these, uh, and this is just to show that this effect actually stands. So this is just um, illustration of the few points that I made. Uh, these are marginal effects for communism over age and by gender. So the slightly darker red line is for males and um, orange for females. And uh, two different uh, frequencies, uh, less frequently two, three times a week and much more frequently four, six times a week. Um, interestingly, as literature suggests, there is a gap between male and female drinking. But for the 20, 30 year gap, these um, uh, behaviors are becoming quite similar for the slightly less frequent alcohol consumption, uh, which is also suggested by the literature, basically that in a post-communism period, uh, the, the um, alcohol consumption is slightly more permissive and the gender gap is narrowing, which is represented here. With more frequent consumption, there's just a big gap but following pretty much the same trajectory. Similar thing is for binge drinking as well, with slightly few, uh, lesser frequency in the gap between 20s and 30s. Um, there's an overlap for females and males, while for the um, slightly more frequent binge drinking, uh, there's a consistent difference between males and females, which converge towards older age and the gap is increasingly large for the younger years. So just to conclude, we find statistically significant effect of communism as a central regime having on alcohol consumption. Especially, um, it's especially sizable for um, binge drinking, but it's also significant and quite large for consumption frequency. Uh, the effect is less uh, consistent of being born in, uh, and raised in post-communism period, which means that uh, it still um, increases the alcohol consumption frequency uh, within, um, but does not have a consistent effect on binge drinking. So just as literature suggests, uh, uh, there's evidence of females drinking less, uh, of middle-aged uh, and old-aged people drinking more frequently, but being less likely to binge drink. <laughs> um, then um, evidence of unemployment having an effect on both uh, 
alcohol consumption frequency and binge drinking. Um, no particular effects of education. Smoking having an increasing effect and uh, some intriguing evidence of violence uh, increasing al alcohol consumption as in binge drinking. Okay, I think I made it in time. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, Francesca, now I invite you to comment on this paper. Um, I need the only, the, um, sorry. sorry. No worries. <laughs> Thank Can we switch to the slide? Maybe I can. Oops. Well, I will just uh, start. Um, so, um, again, it's an honor for me to uh, be discussing the paper. Uh, it was a very, very interesting read. Um, so, um, well, this was just a summary, but um, a paper was explained very clearly, so I don't think I have to go through this. Just one thing, actually, that I've noticed was um, when you, um, maybe in the paper, when you talk about the groups, um, so the groups that, the cohorts that are affected by the communist regime in the in their formative years uh, and how you define a post-communist indicator then um, it was not entirely clear for me um, how the whether the post-communist indicator would include people that spent at least some part of the formative years under the communist period or not so for instance in the table i uh, said <laughs> that but uh, from your presentation it seemed that actually it was people um, that spent their entire formative years after a transition period. So it was not, from, from reading the paper, that was not entirely clear. And then obviously the comparator group is the people that were uh, in, born in Western Europe who spent their uh, formative years in, transition, in, um, in Western Europe. Um, so um, results are very important. This is a very important contribution. Uh, obviously there is a lot of literature that shows that alcohol consumption poses a great health risk and binge drinking increases the probability of death by cardiovascular problems. Uh, there's literature, and I mentioned two of them, uh, of them that uh, um, look at basically increasing mortality in Russia between 1990-1994 and they link that increasing mortality to alcohol consumption. Um, but this paper uncovers how persistent these habits are once formed and it also gives us a fresh look at what happened in Eastern Europe and uh, whereas all the other papers look at Russia and uh, we have uh, now basically this paper looking at what happened in the rest of the region, which is um, uh, very interesting. So um, in the paper, I have some comments on the identification first. Um, um, so um, it describes at the beginning um, these three uh, different drinking patterns. So a Mediterranean where people consume uh, almost daily some wine, but there's low tolerance for public drunkenness, then the Central European type, um, basically in Czech Republic, Zover Republic, where there's frequent cons consumption of beer, and again, low tolerance for public drunkenness, and the nor Northern European type, um, characterized by larger consumption of uh, spirits, uh, uh, Bench drinking is more frequent and higher tolerance for public drunkenness. Um, but due to the nature of the data set that it's used, basically, we have a situation where your um, sort of treated countries uh, pertain to the Central and Northern European type of uh, pattern, and your comparators are uh, have a Mediterranean pattern. So your comparators are countries such as Cyprus, Greece, um, I don't recall them, but basically they have a different type of c consumption. And because you look at the frequency of binge drinking, for instance, which is more a uh, type of, um, pertains more to the Northern European type of uh, pattern, um, your um, more natural comparator groups would have been countries, for instance, Scandinavia, which are not part of your sample. So I'm wondering how your results are driven by sample composition rather than by the communism itself. Um, 
so um, data set uh, used in the paper is a European Health Interview Survey. So um, it's a very interesting data set, and, um, which it, and uh, I think only the first wave was conducted, and there will be a second wave soon, hopefully. Um, so um, countries were covered in different years and in different moments of time. So I was um, wondering whether uh, consumption habits changed during the year, for instance, alcohol consumption is more frequent during summer or like holidays and so effectively comparing you know basically data that was collected in different points of time how can that affect your estimation maybe just a few words in the paper about that and um, and how that there might be recall bias and sort of in your variable um, then uh, the data set contains a lot of observations but a lot of them are drop because of absence basically of valid information on frequency of alcohol consumption and frequency of uh, binge drinking um, and um, which um, worries me a bit in the sense that I'm worried that people might um, underreport their uh, alcohol consumption and if these um, patterns that you indicated are true so for instance in your comparator countries there's a lower tolerance for public drunkenness or like just alcohol consumption I'm wondering whether people in the Mediterranean countries or in your comparator group are more likely to underreport their alcohol consumption. So I'm um, wondering how that could affect the results. Um, your sample includes teenagers aged 15 or above. Um, these are also part of the sort of comparator group. Uh, and again, if the legal drinking age is 18 or over, these people might just underreport their alcohol consumption. These are just observations that, um, you know, um, I was uh, having reading the paper. Um, so. Um, in the paper also you say that basically 45% of the sample works in the military, which I thought was quite high. Uh, so I was wondering, basically it doesn't seem to be a representative sample of the population and um, potentially how that could affect our results. Um, and, uh, and then um, uh, BMI is used as an instrument for health status, um, which um, I was wondering, well, obviously the relationship between BMI and health is not Linear meaning that um, a high BMI is a potential indicator and is an indicator of bad health status, but so is um, low BMI. So just the implication of using that. Um, and then um, I had some comments on the transmission mechanism. So um, I explained very well at the beginning in the literature review how Russian alcohol consumption habits predated communism. There are parts of tradition of uh, celebrations, festivals, etc. And then, um, basically, uh, one couple of in a couple of sentences, you suggest how migration was an important channel through which this alcohol consumption habits spread. Um, which um, I'm not a specialist in migration in the former Soviet Union, but I was wondering how easy it was for people to migrate within the Soviet Union. So, um, for people like me with no background in that, maybe it would be nice to see migration, some data on migration flow is possible to see the extent of each mechanism. And then again, because basically, I don't think you have actually countries from the Soviet Union in your sample, maybe you have Latvia or um, couple, but most of the countries are from Eastern Europe, but they were not part of the Soviet Union. I was, I was wondering whether the migration channel really applies to those countries and how easy it was for people to migrate from Soviet Union to uh, you know, Czech Republic and vice versa. Um, so I had a few comments on average transmission mechanisms that I thought was I found in the literature I thought could be relevant or like um, could be discussed. So maybe one thing was acceptability. Um, there was virtu virtually no unemployment, so sort of people could. Uh, there was virt virtually no punishment uh, for basically showing up drunk at work or like uh, um, there was also no reward for productivity or um, or high quality uh, work and this there's a literature that shows how for instance estimated loss of productivity due to alcohol was 20 percent in Russia so maybe there's also there was also this channel that was sort of accepted and um, another channel was maybe uh, Alcohol consumption, well, there, there are papers that point to the fact that alcohol consumption was actually sort of encouraged because it was a mean for the state to raise revenues. And some papers, historians point to the fact that it could be 
used as a means for um, reducing political dissent. So maybe that was also part of like a plan, not just you know kind of channel through migration. Um, and uh, there's a paper by Treisman that shows that actually prices matter uh, mattered for alcohol consumption. So uh, in the paper, there's no. Um, you know, kind of explanation related to prices, but I was wondering whether you thought about that. You thought that maybe alcohol, though, ha how much the affected alcohols was sort of cheap or available, how that affected um, alcohol consumption in uh, Eastern Europe also. Um, also, another nice paper that decided that actually looks at, for instance, availability and prices of alcohol um, and the fact that um, prices went up and availability was restricting during the anti-alcohol campaign and how that affected habits of people who were 18 in that period. So I think there's also a component there. Um, and then finally, culture. Maybe people do not really, I'm not sure again, if people could move freely between Eastern Europe and Soviet Union, but cultures maybe spread more easily, so maybe through books or like movies or, um, I don't know, this is just a movie that I thought was uh, quite uh, telling. It's, I think it's very famous and basically it's just about an adventure which is which starts because the lead um, protagonist is basically drunk. So it just, uh, and this is a very famous movie, so I was wondering maybe that culture was also a channel. That would be all. Thank you. Would you like to respond to this comment? Oh, okay. So thank you very much for the comments. They were very extensive and uh, actually probably did even a better job at describing some of my research than, <laughs> than me myself. So I will try to address um, some of the points. I don't know if I'll be able to address them all. Um, so first of all, what... Um, In regards to geographical patterns, um, I was aware of the issue that uh, there isn't a great representation of all the geographical units, but at the same time, if you just consider the northern and the central uh, drinking type, um, then there would still be a big difference uh, in regards to binge drinking. Um, then, in respect to season, um, even though I have not checked that, and that's a very good point to see uh, at what time the data was taken, but the way the question is phrased itself is um, about the drinking overall. It's not about the drinking recently, so it would be basically about drinking patterns throughout the year. So at least technically the, the question tackles that, but. Uh, it is possible that just recent drinking behavior might affect uh, what you report. Um, in regards to underreporting uh, drinking behavior, um, I probably, I cannot think of a way how I could control for that. And potentially, I could still wonder why, what would be the main reason for under-reporting if it's uh, autonomous individual data that is not being published to your peers and colleagues. So potentially, but I don't know what to do about that. Um, I know about the mil military sample. It's actually mainly um, defined uh, by the variables that we wanted to use. And uh, so once you use fewer variables, you lose some interesting information. Uh, so that is why we reported the regressions with more of them. But if you just use some of those that um, have much fewer variables, the effect of communism maintains the same and is actually stronger. And then the military sample is much smaller. In regards to BMI, I completely agree it's not a perfect measure. I try to play with it in respect of making it uh, not linear, but uh, like, um, how is it, parabola shape. And uh, the, the, it wasn't no difference, so I thought it wasn't necessary to actually go through that procedure. And um, uh, the tests we ran actually acknowledge it as a reasonable instrument. Then in regards to migration, um, 
I would probably need to check and provide more evidence of that migration happening, but um, just the reading that I did basically suggests that migration did exist and it was part of the political process. So that is why we also simply um, take it as a given that uh, that was part of the propagation mechanism. Um, then in regards to prices of alcohol and culture as a method of spreading uh, the norms, um, since the data itself is much more present, it's not uh, the data from uh, the years of the communist regime, so I would not think that present consumption of alcohol would be directly uh, relevant to the past prices. I guess you could potentially say that um, if prices are much lower in the past, during the years that you're young, you get used to consuming more, but I still, but that in a way is even going with our research in the same line because then those prices were also part of the regime, the way it manifested. So it's all, and it would also be an additional proof that uh, due to something that is happening during your formative years, that effect is being taken on board further in life. And in regards to culture, um, it is a possible mechanism, but I can't think of a way to control for it. I can't uh, think of how I could um, use it as a dummy in terms of how many Soviet films were being watched or whatever else. And since we control for country dummies, so if there are any cult country specific effects, we try to control for that. And if I forgot something, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just tried to note everything I could. Thank you. Are there any questions regarding this paper? Yes, that, that was first. Я перепрошую, я спитаю українською. Дякую за чудову презентацію. Я б попросила уточнити трактовку залежності між насиллям і високим рівнем споживання алкоголя. Ви вивчали взаємозв'язок насилля, коли це була жертва чи агресор? Could somebody translate, please? Uh, could you please explain the uh, relation between violence and alcohol consumption? Was uh, the person consuming alcohol uh, a victim of this uh, violence or was it uh, the person who made the violence? Uh, are you talking about the um, regressive violence? Yes. Okay. Um, the way the variable is defined is basically if the person is exposed to violence in its direct and uh, person's direct environment. So it's basically um, just, I think it's a dummy that basically says, uh, yes, I was exposed to violence or not. It doesn't define if the person itself is a victim or not, but probably exposure to violence does not mean being violent himself, even though I guess that can't be excluded. Because just the way the, the question is phrased, logically you can't exclude, it doesn't ask if you're the, the violent one or if you're the one exp in experiencing it. Okay, one more question. Recently I found out uh, data of the highest alcohol consumption in Lithuania. Have you any explanation of this? Well, Lithuania is not part of my sample, even though I am from Lithuania. But um, I guess that explains why I am interested in doing this research. <laughs> because as I experienced firsthand that the alcohol consumption is definitely permissive back home and uh, because of the anecdotal evidence that it is an Eastern European thing, I thought it would be interesting to find out if that's true. I can't explain why Lithuanians drink more than other Eastern Europeans, sorry. Okay, thank you so, so much. Uh, let's thank our presenter. And I invite Olena Nizalova to present the paper on the effect of to be epidemics on productivity. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. 
uh, this paper sort of stands out from the other papers and if, if I may say it's kind of like off protocol paper late edit it quite lately and I'm extremely thankful to the discussant who was courageous over the last two three days <laughs> to to review the paper and would provide the discussion it also stands out from others because uh, it's not really so if, if you go throughout the sessions, you would see that people usually look at how various factors affect uh, one or the other aspect of well-being. In this paper, it's kind of vice versa. So it looks how health, which is an important component of well-being, affects something else, affects economy. And the history of this paper is such that I wanted to study um, tuberculosis epidemic and I wanted to study something uh, which is quite um, interesting for our country in particular and especially in those times which are uh, we're living through now uh, the underdiagnosis of tuberculosis you know and with the conflict in in the east and people moving across the country this is something that uh, but that's my future research agenda and before I moved to that I was uh, approached by doctors and they said look yeah, we know your research is very important, it's, uh, but, but we do know that it's underdiagnosed. Can you really, you're an economist, can you look at how this epidemic affects the economy? Because hopefully that's what your politicians would listen to. The doctors were from the United States, and they, uh, they so they, they thought that Perhaps we would be able to see whether there is uh, some link uh, on uh, economic part. And yeah, when, when we looked at the literature, uh, what I found out uh, is that, uh, you know, just blandly looking, impact of tuberculosis on economy. The studies which are out there, they are mostly, like I would call them like accounting investigations, because basically the way people um, calculate the economic loss from the TB epidemic is uh, they either just take the uh, direct cost of treating, uh, like basically expenditure on tuberculosis in the country, so that would be one way of approaching this. Um, uh, kind of a slightly more sophisticated thing would be to calculate, the, to get the number of people who died from tuberculosis and multiply that by the value of statistical life and get uh, kind of a loss to the country from uh, uh, losing productive individuals uh, to premature death from tuberculosis. And I was uh, kind of my background uh, is uh, from my PhD. I'm interested in long term care, in how family responsibilities affect uh, and interact with the labor markets. So, what I was thinking is like these are, these people are quite severely affected in their everyday life when they are sick. And because the disease is contagious, you have to take certain measures, you have to take care of these people and so on. So that may affect those who are around them, who are taking care of them. And therefore, the productivity of these people who are taking care, the productivity of the families may be depressed because they have to take care of those uh, individuals. So uh, I started with this specific thinking about the effect of tuberculosis epidemic on the productivity, and the, by the productivity I was thinking about wages of workers. Um, and that kind of offered um, some sort of a convenient setup to an extent uh, to start dealing with the problem of endogeneity because we know that um, tuberculosis is the disease of the poor and, and so like, if people would have had higher wages they, they, um, they would be less likely to get this disease. 
But in, in this setup, uh, we would be looking at the wages of employees, of people who current workers, uh, and they, are, they would be less likely to be, like, if they are diagnosed, they would not be in our sample. There is a high chance that they are not. Uh, if they are underdiagnosed, yes, uh, or I mean, if they, are, if, if they are already starting to be sick, if they already contracted the disease, but they are not uh, being treated yet, uh, they may be in our sample, and we, we don't have the means uh, of distinguishing them. But uh, then our measure of to be epidemic comes from the people who are being treated, diagnosed, and they are like in the healthcare system defined as uh, TB patients. But then, um, you know, thinking about this, uh, we distinguished between the two measures of tuberculosis because also interesting feature of the literature on tuberculosis and so it's unfortunate feature and it, it's probably because of the data availability some researchers use the incidence of tuberculosis others use the prevalence of tuberculosis the first one is the number of new diagnosed cases over the period of time, so it's like a flow measure. The second one is the prevalence, so that's the number of people who live with these diagnoses. And so people use them interchangeably. So they talk about tuberculosis and then they use the measure which is probably available. And when, I, uh, when we were thinking about these two measures, they, they have really different meaning in, in our setup if we, if we talk about wages. So the first motivation uh, which I said, uh, I told you about, um, was, uh, you know, the, the, this affecting the productivity of uh, caregivers or, you know, uh, families and, and communities. This is more related to prevalence. So if you have sick people around, so uh, you would have to take care of them, uh, you would be less productive, your thoughts would be elsewhere, so uh, your wages could be lower. But then the incidence is more relating to the theory which is known in labor economics as compensating wage differentials theory. So it's basically the risk. So keeping the number of sick people constant, this incidence rate act as a risk which has to be compensated. So companies which work in the areas where there are higher to be epidemic have to offer higher wages for workers uh, to work there. So that's, that's the motivation with that. And so we want to look at those indirect economic impact of tuberculosis. So it's on top of anything else which you can calculate with the expenditure and death rates and so on. And we also want, because of the contagious nature of the disease, we want to find out whether uh, this impact spread beyond the affected region or it's contained. Uh, so as I said, we look at the impact of TB incidence and prevalence. Uh, on productivity of people in terms of wages, but we also uh, went a bit beyond looking at the average total factor productivity. Uh, and uh, I'll get, so basically this average total factor productivity is a, is a mysterious measure which is uh, like, um, could be defined as managerial capital, talent, uh, and, and so on, you know, ideas, and, you know, so, some capital which firms have, which is not explained by the uh, workers and capital, um, and so on. So, uh, what, and we use for that the rayon level data. This is administratively collected data by the uh, state statistics offices and by the centers for medical statistics. Uh, this is limited to 2003 to 2009. Uh, for the, we have more data, but only in those years, our state statistical office collected data on the education of workers in the firms. And this is an important thing for the compensating wage differentials theory uh, to control for this. 
So uh, I have already explained the mechanism of the effect uh, uh, in terms of productivity uh, of workers. Uh, the, the prevalence we expect to have negative effect on wages and the incidence of tuberculosis. Controlling for prevalence would have a positive effect, so uh, higher wages have to be paid. Uh, and the, in terms of the productivity of firms, it's a little bit trickier, but it's kind of also straightforward thing. If you, if you think about this mysterious measure, which is managerial or entrepreneurial or creative capital, um, if you think about poor epidemiological situation, if you think that the, the people you know, have high chances of contracting the disease, and then they also, once they um, contracted it, there would be lower life expectancy. So there is, if you go through labor uh, economic theories, there is no reason for these people to care much about investment in human capital because they would have fewer years to realize this higher potential in terms of human capital. And, and the same way in, in the human capital of their children and so on. And from that, you can think that there would be less creativity, innovation, and managerial talent. So firms would be less productive. And in terms of total factor productivity, yes, well, this, this total factor productivity, uh, sorry, the, the incident, impact of the incidence rate, impact of the risk, uh, the total factor productivity, it's the remainder of the firm profits after taking into account capital and um, uh, wages um, and, and compensating to uh, workers in terms of wages. But um, we know that people can uh, can be compensated by non-wage benefits at, works, uh, at work. And so the same argument goes here. Like if, if you are a firm that has to keep workers in this region and attract workers, you will need to be more productive in this area in order to be able to offer those non-wage benefits um, on top of wages. So these are the equations which we define. Uh, I, I have very little time, um, so I'll, I'll kind of skip to that. Um, uh, we also uh, introduce the um, spatial dimension to that. So we calculate a measure uh, uh, weighted by the spatial matrix uh, so that the, the interpretation of this coefficient, which is WTB, and the gamma W, the interpretation of this coefficient would be if the tuberculosis rates increased in all of the neighboring regions by 1%, then the impact on the outcome of interest, uh, like wages or TFP, would increase uh, by gamma W. Okay. So I'll just skip to the results, probably. So as I said, it's um, six years of data. Uh, the sample size is about 3,000 observations. So uh, we, we, we were also, there are, as I said at the beginning, one way that we are addressing the, the uh, endogeneity concern is that these are separate measures. So one is about sick people and the other about uh, other people who are workers who are not diagnosed. Uh, the other way is that we are taking one year lag for the um, independent variables. So for all tuberculosis measures and all the control variables, we are taking one year lag. And we are looking at the wages and TFP uh, next year. And then we also applied fix fixed effect methodology in case there is something which doesn't vary over time but is specific of this uh, small region which can affect both uh, wages uh, or TFP and the uh, TB epidemic. So what we find is strikingly robust in this specification and it's even more um, the effect of, of, of the Sorry, I think that, that uh, it's, uh, there is a mistake here in terms of wh where the... 
So prevalence should be the second row and incidence is the first row. So uh, the, the TB prevalence uh, decreases wages in the area. 1% uh, of increase in the tuberculosis prevalence decreases wages by 0.4%. And uh, the increase in incidence rate by 1% increases wages by 1.7%. Uh, it's, it, it's in terms of wages. The effects are smaller in terms of TFP as probably would be expected, so it's like even further in direct effects uh, than, than uh, in the case of wages. We also uh, tried to separate and calculate total factor productivity in different um, industries like agriculture, manufacturing, and services. And there are some uh, heterogeneous effects along these lines. We added this spatial lag uh, model, so uh, tub tuberculosis measures in the surrounding regions. So whatever is far away doesn't matter. Only if you have common border, so those regions, which rayons, which have common border with your rayon, uh, have uh, uh, importance in this specification. So as you can see, there is still uh, a similar effect throughout, so positive effect of TB incidence um, uh, in terms of wages, likewise in, in the own rayon and also in the neighboring rayons, and a negative effect uh, in terms of prevalence. Um, in terms of TFP, we don't find the spatial effect uh, from the prevalence of TB, but we do find it in terms of incidence. We also added, this is a much more, um, as I said, this is like an additional paper and still work in progress. Um, we did, um, add, because there is, a, there is a consideration about a concern uh, about the spatial correlation between wages and total factor productivity. So we tried to uh, use this spatial Durbin model to include spatial lag of dependent variable, which is uh, clearly endogenous, and it is being instrumented with the spatial lags of all of the exogenous variables in, in the model. So this, um, uh, frankly, uh, this is like something I'm trying to learn now and, and discuss with, uh, with my co-author and uh, like literally what is the interpretation of those things because it, it's very complicated relationship in terms of spatial dynamics and how do we interpret these coefficients that, that we get there. But s some of the results are, um, are still uh, there uh, in terms of wages, uh, but uh, TFP is much trickier to interpret. Um, this is something, um, it's a very interesting thing which could be taken to policy makers, but uh, we're still working on that. But a rough idea is the following, like if we were, because this whole calculation, the, the, the motivation is to get a measure of full economic cost of TB epidemic in order to be able to understand, do we invest enough to contain the epidemic? And in order to do that, um, we, we need to kind of understand the measures. If we did something to these um, TB uh, characteristics, uh, TB measures, uh, what would happen? So based on our main estimates, which is not including the spatial effect. As I said, it's more complicated to, uh, to calculate. So based on the first table, what we find is that if the TB prevalence rate, so if the ten, uh, were to be decreased by 10%, so 10% uh, of current uh, number of patients would, would become healthy, that would result in a 1.25% increase in GDP in terms of uh, higher wages. Uh, and via the TFP channel, it would be 1.95. So these are quite large um, 
effects. And we, we obviously would like to investigate this a bit more. And to give you a comparison, at the moment, uh, Ukraine TB-related expenditure, not only from the government, but including Global Fund, like all every, every, every international organization which ever contributes uh, to, to the um, tuberculosis programs, is 0.04% of GDP. So, um, you know, even if we are overestimating to some extent the effects of that, it, it's nowhere comparable to the little amount which is being invested to contain this epidemic. Thank you. Thank you. I invite Alexandra Bedley to comment on this paper. Thank you for inviting and uh, uh, for the beginning I would like to say yes, that paper is in the progress and today Olena did a good job I mean explaining many things which are not in the paper yet <laughs> because it was a draft. So I, I think that many things that you have just pointed now I mean like they have to be in the paper like motivation and uh, very interesting things about insights in equations, because in the paper currently, I mean, like equations are given just percent without any explanations why this or what another variable is there. So I really needed this information. So what is interesting about, I mean, like why this paper was interesting to read, and uh, just because it is really important for Ukraine, really, because GDP in Ukraine remains low compared to other countries. For example, with you members since May 2014, so it's our neighbors. At the same time, life expectancy remains low, and one of the reasons is the bad health, poor health of Ukrainians. And uh, what we see also from the data is the death rate from tuberculosis is much higher in Ukraine than in European countries, and uh, including, uh, again, EU members since May 2004. And what is interesting here is uh, that there is a huge difference between male and female, basically, that uh, uh, death rate for men is much higher than for women, which should be taken into account. I will talk about this a bit later in the research, probably, or some explorations should be there. Uh, incidence and the prevalence of tuberculosis in Ukraine is much higher. All this taken in together makes the topic of the research really important and uh, for Ukraine. And uh, the question is correct. What is the economic impact of uh, tuber tuberculosis in Ukraine? And what authors saw is that impact on productivity is that 10% increase in uh, TB uh, prevalence leads to 1% reduction in TFP and uh, uh, leads to a reduction of wages uh, uh, around uh, 4%. I think that there is a good use of data, but more descriptions should be in the paper for this data because I mean like, I know a bit about this data sets, but it's not there. Uh, Lena had already answered the question which I had, basically, why we have stopped uh, in 2009. And I think still that probably you should explore more on the data and uh, add other years as well, probably without education, just to see what are the results and probably I mean, like just to check the robustness as well. Because uh, really you are not checking the impact of education on wages as well, but uh, tuberculosis. So. That should be there. Um, I have a question on the possible question uh, on, uh, of, on omitted variables, basically. You use fixed effect, but still I'm cautious about what you have put in the model. And basically in the wage model, you have TB prevalence and um, uh, incidence, education, and then there is unemployment. You don't say which one and uh, also density of population and sphere of urban population. But at the same time, for example, there is no uh, information on economic structure on, because in Ukraine, average wage is quite different uh, depending on the economic structure of the rayon, whether it's industrial rayon or agricultural, because uh, uh, there is a huge difference between uh, different sectors in wages. And uh, some of this probably is depicted by fixed effect that you are using, but I don't, th I'm not, I'm, I'm quite skeptical that it depicts everything. And there are no kind of, in even TFP equation, you have the same variables and there is nothing about 
you have there, I mean, like when you calculate in TFP for manufacturing separately and agriculture, I mean, like it's a bit different. But for wages, I think it should be there. It would be interesting if, it, if it's possible to estimate these two equations, I mean, like in a, as a model, basically, just together and, uh, I mean, like in certain different variables. Because currently it's two separate equations, and even though I think that they impact each other. Um, the result of this uh, compensation wage differentials is quite, uh, for me, it was kind of uh, counterintuitive because uh, it's really difficult to imagine that in Ukraine uh, to be incidents is really kind of taken as a ris risk factor by our employers who pay more because of high incidents. Uh, therefore, this again raises the question about the emitted variables that probably there is should be something in the equation which depicts this. Um, if, I mean, like, the robustness will check but that there is a case, I mean, like, it will, it will be an interesting result, basically, for Ukraine. Um, you have basically explored more today on this uh, control and for prevalence of the TB, uh, but I think that it should be put more in the question, in, into the paper, why you think that this control is the correct one, because it reminds me of this Stibler rule, which was basically shown that it doesn't work anymore in, in, in most, most countries. Um, you have talked about this today a lot, but uh, I still think that in the paper you have to explore this more, this potential indigeneity due to reverse causality, that the level of income basically might define lifestyle and health in the rayon and might impact the TB incidence and prevalence and not vice versa. Uh, therefore, further analysis would be valuable on this issue because uh, at least there, there is a need for this uh, in the paper. Uh, as I said, there is huge difference between uh, um, tuberculosis for men and me women in, the, uh, in Ukraine. And therefore, gender aspect is very important and probably you should look at this as well, probably in this paper or another one. Uh, the aspect of the um, impact on GDP, which you have shown in the paper, it should be explored more in the paper because uh, it's uh, not uh, explicit how you calculated this uh, impact, basically. I mean, like, you have to just put more uh, effort there. And the uh, policy implications uh, should be, I mean, like, a part of the paper, especially taking into account the motivation that you had uh, when you have started writing the paper. So it was clearly kind of a policy question, not a scientific one, because while reading the paper, I was, uh, was clearly sure that it's more scientific paper, not policy-oriented. But as you mentioned now, I mean, like, it's policy-oriented, therefore policy implications should be there. Uh, but overall, I mean, like, the subject is really interesting, and I wish you good luck in just completing this research. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you have any questions to Olena? Okay, well, then Olena yeah, responds, sure. and yeah, we'll finish. Well, this if, time. if I if I can just really quickly pick up on 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 some, but thank you very much. These are very valuable comments. Um, I think that you're you're right, and we are also concerned with the reverse causality and in wages. It's it would be we would still be concerned and would have liked to to have more means to address this. Um, but I think that we are more kind of safer in terms of total factor productivity and getting similar results give us a bit of a confidence in that because uh, in total factor productivity, these are actually residual total factor productivity after controlling for all of the industry effects. So these are these are like independent of industry structure completely. So that that, that is not uh, there. Um, and I, I'm thinking that this is very interesting suggestion. We can add industry structure because uh, the the data on TFP is coming from the firm level data, and we can simply calculate. Uh, the industry structure and add this. So thank you. That 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 could be added. The gender aspect. We we don't have unfortunately wages based on on gender. These are rayon level uh, reported wages. So we, we can't really explore this. But I agree that there is an, an important um, difference in terms of health outcomes. And well, if 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 I can leave it at the, here. But <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Uh, let's thank all our panelists who presented very interesting research. And we'll meet here at 4.45. Uh, in this room, there will be a panel on ULMS, and uh, the policy panel on health will be in the next room. Now, coffee break.